Can I welcome everyone to the 28th meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2017? And can I please remind everyone present to turn their mobile phones and other devices onto silent for the duration of the meeting? The first item of business is a decision on whether to take uh, all future considerations of the Children and Young People Information Sharing Scotland Bill, Stage 1, Draft Report in private. Is everyone content that all future considerations of the draft report be taken in private? Thank you. The second item of business is on witness e expenses for the committee's education reforms work. Are members content to delegate sign off of any witness expenses to me? Thank you very much. And the next item of business is our final evidence session as part of the Children and Young People Information Sharing Scotland Bill. Today we will hear from the Cabinet Secretary for Education and Skills and Government Officials. And can I welcome to the committee John Swinney, Cabinet Secretary for Education and Skills, Ellen Burt, Bill Team Leader, and John Patterson, Divisional Solicitor, Scottish Government. Uh, thank you for coming along today. And I understand, Cabinet Secretary, you'd like to make a short opening statement. Uh, thank you, Convener. I welcome the opportunity to be with the committee today to discuss the Children and Young People Information Sharing Scotland Bill. I'd like to say at the outset that I accept unreservedly the Supreme Court decision and, I, and as a consequence, I accept that the information sharing provisions in the Children and Young People Scotland Act 2014 did not adequately respect the right to private and family life. The Bill addresses the issues raised by the Supreme Court and will ensure that the rights of children and young people and their parents are respected. The Bill has two overarching objectives. Firstly, its provisions will support agencies and individuals to work with children, young people and families in an integrated way that also facilitates the lawful and proportionate sharing of information. This will ensure that every child and young person can better access the support and the help that they need to succeed. Secondly, the Bill will allow, will allow the selections in the 2014 Children and Young People Scotland Act on the Named Person Service and the Child's Plan to be commenced. Without this bill to address the Supreme Court judgment, those legislative provisions cannot be commenced, effectively removing two key elements of the getting it right for every child approach, which are entitlements arising from families themselves asking for improvements in the support that they need and want. This approach is required as too many children and families continue to struggle to navigate services, and too many children and young people don't get early access to support which could help them to succeed. Relying on the good practice of some, and hoping that others catch up will not deliver for every child and young person in Scotland. That is why legislation is required. We know that effective and proportionate sharing of information is essential to getting it right for every child. That is why the duty to consider, which is at the heart of this bill, is necessary. For the first time, relevant authorities and named person service providers will be required by law to consider the information they hold and whether the sharing of such information could support, promote or safeguard the well-being of a child or young person. It also provides professionals with a focus to consider the consequences for well-being of not sharing information when consent to share is not granted. The measures in this bill must provide the clarity and certainty that many are looking for in relation to how to share information lawfully within the context of fulfilling the functions of getting it right for every child. I've listened closely and considered carefully all of the evidence which the committee has taken during the Stage 1 proceedings on the Bill. As I set out in my letter earlier this week, I accept that there is more that I can do to ensure that we give everyone the certainty and clarity they are looking for following the Supreme Court decision, not just in relation to the Bill provisions, but also to measures which the Bill will give effect to, and indeed broader getting it right for every child ambitions. Many witnesses have called for greater clarity about what the named person is and what it is not. We will therefore develop and deliver a positive awareness raising campaign which will make clear for children, young people, parents and practitioners what the Getting It Right for Every Child approach is about and how the named person will support them. And the Government will lead it but will ensure input from others to inform the approach that we take. Witnesses also raise concerns about resources and support for implementation. Reflecting on the evidence presented to the committee, I can confirm that further financial resources over and above those set out in the financial memorandum will be provided to assist implementation beyond the first year of introduction. I intend to consult with stakeholders on the detail of this multi-year approach as the Bill proceeds. The Code of Practice provided for in the Bill is one important part of the suite of materials that will be made available to practitioners to support their work. Whilst I had hoped that the illustrative draft code of practice would demonstrate how the power to make a binding 
code contained in primary legislation could work to address the issues raised in the Supreme Court judgment, I acknowledge that this approach has not had the intended effect. It is essential that we get right the code of practice provided for in the Bill, as well as the statutory guidance required under the 2014 Act and other support materials which will be required. To ensure this, I will establish the GERFEC Practice Development Panel this month. This panel will have an independent chair and broad and relevant stakeholder membership to ensure that these materials are workable, comprehensive and user-friendly. This approach will allow for full and proper consideration of changes to data protection law as a result of the General Data Protection Regulations and the UK Data Protection Bill. This panel will ensure that the experience and expertise of practitioners informs the material through dialogue and interaction with the wider stakeholder community and that practical knowledge of information sharing in the public sector and children's services is the foundation for the development of these materials. As I outlined to the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, my intention has been always to ensure meaningful dialogue and scrutiny of the Code of Practice by Parliament. I am happy to accept the recommendation of that committee that Parliament be given final approval of the Code of Practice and can advise that I will bring forward such an amendment at Stage 2 in the Bill process. Convener, I am determined that this Bill will ensure everyone working to support children, young people and families in Scotland will not only do so within the requirements of the law, but will also feel confident in fulfilling our con collective ambition to get it right for every child. And uh, I look forward to answering questions from the committee this morning. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Before I uh, start ask uh, the questions, uh, I'd just like to put on record my thanks to everyone who's contributed already to the committee's work on the Children and Young People Information Sharing Scotland Bill, and particularly was to thank the attendees of the focus groups last week for taking time in their evenings to come and contribute to the evidence. Cabinet Secretary, um, we received a letter earlier this week from a, a number of organisations who originally voiced a great deal of concern, and to be fair, still have some of that, those concerns at this stage, but seem to be now coming round to saying that it's important this piece of legislation passes. Why do you think that, or, or what would you put down to the fact that they seem to have changed their position in your view? What do you think has happened in, uh, since we started taking evidence? I think what has happened in the consideration of the bill so far is that the my attempt to try to be helpful to the committee by providing an, a draft illustrative code of practice um, without all of the consultation that we would ordinarily put into such an effort um, has proved not to be helpful. And what, what this bill does is this bill makes um, some very clear changes to the law in relation to the changing the provisions of the 2014 Act to establish the, um, the duty to consider information sharing as opposed to an obligation to share information, which clearly the Supreme Court judged not to be consistent with Article 8 provisions. The approach that we've taken, again informed by other decisions of the Supreme Court, is to rely on informing that duty to consider um, through a code of practice. And that code of practice will be binding, but for it to be binding, it has to be clear and it has to be informative. Uh, I took a decision um, late in the proceedings of the, uh, the, the preparation of this bill to put an, an illustrative code of practice into the committee along with the bill. Uh, because I took that decision late, there was not the opportunity for the breadth of consultation. I thought it would be helpful to the committee to have the look of what a code of practice might be like. I accept that that has created some confusion and uncertainty among stakeholders. And in listening to that evidence over the course of the last few weeks, uh, I have made it clear to stakeholders that the provisions of the draft illustrative code of practice are what they are, the contents of a draft illustrative code of practice are not the final product. And I have set out to stakeholders uh, and also to the committee the approach I intend to take to ensure that we have a, a full, engaged, participative approach to the formulation of that code of practice uh, 
um, and uh, I welcome the comments of stakeholders um, who have uh, embraced that approach. Can, can I ask that these stakeholders that have, uh, wrote this letter, will they be consulted? Will they be part of the, the solution for the, the new code of practice? Yes. Thank you. Okay, uh, Liz, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, Cabinet Secretary, I wonder if I can take you back to uh, the uh, Children and Young People's uh, Bill when it first went through this Parliament. Uh, at the time, um, we were advised uh, by the Scottish Government that the uh, legal advice um, was accurate. And of course, that uh, turned out not to be the case. Um, and at the time, uh, there were legal uh, advisers, independent legal advisers, who warned of the potential danger of exactly what the decision would be in the, uh, in the Supreme Court, as it turned out. Uh, could, could I ask you, Cabinet Secretary, um, because I think it's very important to this committee as we attempt to scrutinise this bill, could I ask you to outline what legal advice you have taken this time? I think I need to put the, the question from Liz Smith into uh, a wider context because when Parliament passed the legislation, obviously the government proposed it to Parliament and we took the necessary advice in preparing that legislation. The legislation was then tested twice in the courts of Scotland, in the outer house and the inner house, and the bill was, um, and the legal challenges were dismissed in the outer house and the inner house of the Court of Session, the highest courts in Scotland. The case was then referred to the Supreme Court. And I think when you look at the practice of the Supreme Court in the period between 2014, when our legislation was passed, and the judgment that emerged from the Supreme Court in July 2016, in that period, the Supreme Court had been pursuing a consistent line of legal interpretation and legal analysis in a number of judgments which had not preceded 2014 but had followed 2014, where in a whole host of different questions they were requiring public authorities to set out legislative interpretations of legislative provisions in, accord, in their words, in accordance with the law. And that emergence of that strain of thinking in the Supreme Court's consideration um, postdated the 2014 consideration of the bill. And obviously that clearly influenced the judgment of the Supreme Court in July of 2016. Now I accept that the interpretation of the law moves on and the Supreme Court has jurisdiction over these questions. So that's why at the outset of my comments to the committee this morning, I unreservedly accepted the Supreme Court judgment. So in, in defence of the advice the government took in 2014, that advice was based on the legal debate at that time. And obviously the decisions of the outer house and the inner house were taken within that context as well. The world has moved on uh, subsequent to 2014 um, with the, um, the decision of the Supreme Court, which is why I'm now taking um, the steps that I'm taking with this legislation. Now, in relation to what legal advice um, I, I've taken, um, Liz Smith will know the conventions that ministers follow about whether or not legal advice has or has not been taken. But let me just say to the committee, I, I, I would not be here today if I hadn't taken all the necessary advice that I believed I, I should and ought to take and follow in getting to the point we're at today. Uh, thank you for that, Cabinet Secretary. I mean, notwithstanding the context that you've given, uh, the fact of the matter was that the Supreme Court made a ruling uh, that you know, has been uh, very difficult as far as this policy is concerned. And our difficulty as a committee is that as we scrutinise the new bill, we have members of the legal establishment who are either um, very concerned that the bill does not address, or in some cases does not fully address, uh, the legal concerns that were raised by the Supreme Court. And therefore, our, our 
scrutiny uh, responsibility is to ensure that we are holding the Scottish Government to account about the legal advice that has been provided. And we, we're sitting here this morning uh, having uh, listened to uh, legal advice that is still very concerned about some of the legal context of the new bill. And that is set against your comments to the Delegated Powers Committee where you believe that, uh, that particularly in the light of the Faculties of Advocates, that advice is incorrect. Could you explain to this committee why you believe that the legal advice that you have taken uh, does address all the concerns of the Supreme Court? The, the issues that were raised by the Supreme Court um, essentially related to uh, two questions. One is about the proportionality of the consideration of the approach to information sharing. And the second was about the distillation of the legal framework to ensure that it was clear to practitioners the legal framework in which they operated. So those are the two issues which are at the heart of the Supreme Court judgment. And um, the measures that I've taken are designed to inject proportionality into the question of the sharing of information. So there isn't a duty to share, there is a duty to consider sharing. <laughs> Which, and then we then set out, and the Code of Practice will do so, the exercise of, proportion, of how that proportionality question should be exercised. And then secondly, the Supreme Court judged, and this is my point about setting out the provisions in accordance with law, that we hadn't essentially marshalled these propositions in a way that practitioners could readily access that information. I think the Supreme Court talked about a logical, uh, a logical puzzle that lay at the heart of it all. And uh, the, the bill that is before the committee makes those provisions. Now, if I look at some of the evidence that um, the committee considered on the legal question, and Liz Smith is, is absolutely correct that issues have been raised by the Faculty of Advocates in this respect, but the representative of the Law Society of Scotland said, um, uh, Kenny Meehan, uh, the move from a duty to share to, a power to, share inf uh, to a power to share information and an emphasis on the need to consider whether information is relevant and can be shared is a helpful safeguard from the perspective of ensuring proportionality. I simply use those two points, both of which are contained within the legal debate which the committee has heard, to illustrate the fact, and of course we, we are legislators, we, 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 we deal with legal debate about different provisions and we must decide. And it's not a new situation for us to find ourselves in, we find ourselves in it uh, uh, on a constant basis. But what I believe we have done here is to look carefully at the issues in the Supreme Court judgment, because I'm acutely aware that the issues raised by the Supreme Court judgment must be addressed, must be addressed. And we've taken the necessary advice and steps to get us into the position whereby we can um, put a bill in front of the, the, the Parliament for scrutiny, which enables us to do that. Now that, of course, will not allow, or not, um, will not enable legal debate to disappear. Legal debate will be around on these questions. I accept that. But what I would um, say to the committee is that the government has taken the necessary steps to address those points. Okay, I'm sure other uh, colleagues want to come in on, on this point too, but uh, can I <clears throat> just make the point again that as a, as a committee, we are in an exceptionally difficult position here because if we relate to 2013-14, uh, um, it was very clear at that time that there was an, a legal opinion out there which was subsequently proven to be correct, uh, that the bill uh, had a lot of legal issues. And we have in front of us just now a, a Scottish government that's telling us that this new bill has addressed these concerns, and to use your own words, uh, time does move on, and part of that time moving on means that there is new legislation, uh, particularly in terms of data protection, coming down the line in the not-too-distant future. 
But we've also got legal opinion out there that is still questioning, in some cases, uh, very significantly questioning whether, in fact, the Scottish Government has got its uh, legal advice correct. Now, in my opinion, I think that this legal uh, opinion matters very much uh, to the, the, the rest of the uh, debate. I think it matters to the effective uh, level of scrutiny in Parliament. And therefore, can I ask again, Cabinet Secretary, are you absolutely confident that this bill uh, will not be challenged in a legal context again? First of all, can I say that, um, and I come back to something I've said already, which contests the point that Elizabeth is making about legal debate in advance of the 2014 bill. The 2014 bill was tested in the outer house and the inner house of the court of session. And proven to be and, wrong. <laughs> pardon? And, and overruled. Proven to be... Well, well but I, I, it's not for me to, to question the judgments of the inner house the or the outer house. My duty as a legislator is to respect the decisions of the courts, and mm. those two courts validated the approach that we had taken. Subsequently, it went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court took a different view. And I'm respecting that opinion, because it's my duty to respect what the courts say. Uh, but I simply, for completeness, I'm making the point that the legal position taken by the Scottish Government was um, validated by both the outer and the inner house. So it's wrong to say that um, there was no legal uh, judgment and debate in these questions. On the second point, can I say this will not be challenged legally? Well, that's not a matter for me to, to say. I can't stop individuals challenging this legally. This is a free country. People can bring forward whatever legal challenges they wish to bring forward. But um, certainly from my point of view, the issues raised by the Supreme Court judgment are the issues I am obliged to address if I, w if I wish to commence the provisions of the 2014 Act in relation to parts four and five. And that's precisely what I'm bringing before <laughs> Parliament with confidence that those provisions um, have the legal foundation to address those issues. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ross Green. Thanks, Convener. <coughs> there seems to have been a, a suggestion that a number of organisations who uh, express concern and whose positions have moved on, that it's simply been down to a, an initial lack of understanding of what the government was proposing. And as much as I find that potentially understandable, given that there seems to have been a failure to live up to the, the promise of a summer of, of comprehensive consultation. I think it is about something far more substantial than that. But to look at the um, evidence from the Children's Commissioner specifically, the Commissioner says, and I'll, I'll just quote the last line of it, just to ensure I'm um, being accurate, uh, that the legislation is intended to address the technical deficiencies in the Children and Young Persons Act relating to information sharing by amending the Act to ensure it's compliant with the Data Protection Act and with the ECHR. The bill as currently drafted does not achieve this. Why do you believe the Children and Young Persons Commissioner takes that position? And what do you believe that they have not understood? Uh, well, that's... I, I, an issue, essentially, I think, for the Children and Young Persons Commissioner to set out to the committee and their the rationale for so doing. My view on that is that the Supreme Court raised two important questions uh, for the government to consider, and they're the ones that I addressed in my answer a moment ago to, to Liz Smith. And the government has brought forward provisions that do exactly that, that directly engage on those questions. Now, the, Mr. Greer said that, that, that there seemed to be a, 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 a suggestion that um, stakeholders had not understood the government's provisions. That's not my position. My position is that the government has quite clearly not explained effectively its provisions in the draft illustrative code of practice. And I've set out to the committee why that happened. It happened because I took a judgment during the preparation of the bill that it would be better to provide for the committee a draft illustrative code of practice, because I thought the committee would say to me, um, well, we've got this bill, and it's dependent on a, on a code of practice. Where's the code of practice? So I thought, for completeness, I would provide a draft illustrative code of practice to, to show the, the type of territory we would be covering. But I accept that we didn't have adequate time to consult with stakeholders who would have been able to give us a more enhanced proposition. Uh, and as a consequence, uh, I can't expect these stakeholders to uh, 
um, be um, comfortable with its contents if they've not had the adequate opportunity to participate in the process. So it's not a lack of understanding on their part, it's an acceptance on my part that we decided to do something for which we didn't have adequate time in the bill preparation to engage our stakeholders and um, I'll make sure that happens uh, as we take forward the, the bill and the design of the code of practice. The provision I set out in the 2014 Act was deemed disproportionate. The government's proposal is to bring in a, the new provision, the uh, statutory duty to consider. Bearing in mind the, I would suggest, almost certainty of a further legal challenge to this, would it not have been a legally far more secure position, instead of introducing a new provision, to simply um, state that information sharing should take place under existing data, uh, data sharing frameworks? I, 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 my view would be that is precisely what we have done, that we are, um, we are saying in the bill that any, the consideration that has to be undertaken about information sharing must be entirely compatible with the existing legal framework and that in the supporting documentation to the bill that's available for practitioners, we will address the second issue from the Supreme Court judgment, which is to set out a, clearly a distillation of what that framework looks like to enable um, practitioners to be able to take forward uh, their, uh, their judgments in exercising that duty to consider. And just finally, there was a previously a requirement on the, the face of the legislation to have regard to the views of the child or young person taking into account their level of maturity, etc. Um, why is that no longer the case? What that, that will be the case in the way in which the judgments that are arrived at around the seeking of consent to share information and the, the clear involvement of children and young people as part of that process, which would be set out in the Code of Practice. Thank you. Thank you. Ruth McGuire. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, we've had feedback from stakeholders that um, GERFIC, that getting it right for every child, is a world-class practice framework. Um, Two of the elements of that are the children's plan and in person, um, parts four and five. What will the impact be if we don't bring forward the information sharing? As things stand just now, I cannot commence parts four and five of the bill um, and the provisions on the child's plan and information sharing cannot be commenced without alterations because the legal framework is not... Um, is, has had the issues raised with it by the Supreme Court. So the, unless we bring forward this legislation and secure this legislation, then those elements of the bill cannot be commenced. Okay. And can I ask, in um, the government's stakeholder engagement, have you heard any alternatives that both address the Supreme Court judgment and allow commencements of Part 4 and 5? The government arrived at the contents of this bill after a period of consultation that took place in the latter part of 2016. And as we engaged in that discussion with stakeholders, um, the information we gathered in that process led us to the formulation of this bill. So I am satisfied that at that moment we had a good and open discussion with stakeholders about the correct approach to address the issues raised by the Supreme Court, which got us to the position of the legislation that's now in front of the committee. I did not hear approaches that allowed us to do this differently, um, or that would enable us to achieve the purposes envisaged in the original legislation of ensuring that the named person um, proposition was more widely available in Scotland through legislation um, that would enable that to be achieved uh, without the, the changes to the law that we're, now, that we're now making. So that dialogue was very helpful in getting me to the point of, of, uh, of realising what measures we had to take to, um, to, to ensure this was the case. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Um, Oliver.
Uh, thank you, uh, convener. Um, I hear uh, what the Cabinet Secretary said in response to uh, other colleagues around not having control over whether or not individuals choose uh, to challenge this legislation. Uh, but given the complexity uh, and given the fact that we've seen a leading family law QC, the Information Commissioner and a number of other legal experts uh, telling us that the bill is open to challenge, it's, it's really how confident uh, the Cabinet Secretary is, uh, given the legal advice, uh, that uh, the Scottish Government would be successful in the event of a legal challenge? The judgment on that question is essentially informed by looking at what the Supreme Court said in July 2016 and identifying have the issues that they raised been adequately and directly addressed by the provisions in this bill. And that's what I focused on in my thinking around this and in the advice that I have taken. Because quite clearly, I want to be in a position where the legislation, if challenged, is uh, unsuccessfully challenged. So my consideration has been very much focused on those uh, direct questions of proportionality, if I could summarise them as proportionality and codification, and the provisions on the bill directly address those questions, and I'm therefore confident that the government has addressed the issues in the Supreme Court now. But fundamentally, I have to accept that that's not, you know, that's my best assessment of it. If there was to be a challenge, then um, the courts would have to determine that challenge. Because yeah. um, I think that's one of my uh, big uh, concerns, because I think a huge amount of damage could be done uh, if there was to be another successful challenge, and I think that would you know, pretty much derail a huge part of the Scottish Government and this Parliament's agenda. And, you know, that's where I think as a committee it's difficult for us because we don't have access, obviously, to the Scottish Government's legal advice. So we're making a very tricky uh, decision. Uh, a large part of that is based on, on your own, you know, assessment and, and, and sorry, the Cabinet Secretary's assessment uh, of the law and how confident you are. I just wondered, you know, given how controversial this is, given the big challenges, I'm trying to just get a feel for you know how confident the cabinet secretary is. Would you be willing to take sort of personal responsibility and consider your own position if this legislation falls apart? You know, it's just on a sort of scale. It's just to get an the idea. The committee is not really the place to ask for his resignation. <laughs> I'm not, well, I, I'm only asking for his uh, resignation. I, thought, if, I actually thought if, 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 if I actually this thought, legislation falls apart, convener. I actually thought. I actually thought the way Mr. Mundell's question was going, I, I was asking, I, I almost thought Mr. Mundell was going to ask me if I would place a bet so on this, <laughs> oh, <laughs> which I, I, I most I, definitely am. I, I, I take that kind of assessment as well. You know, it's a sort of on a, you know, on a scale of one to ten, how, how confident are you? Well, I, 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 think, I think the committee knows me well enough to know that I take forward my ministerial responsibilities in a deadly serious fashion, mm -hmm. and. I take all proper advice and consideration to come to the conclusions that I've come to. Now, I've come to the committee this morning and I've been quite candid about um, a, a, a misjudgment that I have made about giving the committee a code of practice that was draft and it was illustrative and had all the caveats in the book, but it just wasn't. It's created more confusion and, I'm, and I didn't want to do that and I'm sorry that that's the case that the committee has... Uh, has had quite a bit of its time taken up by the, the debate around the code of practice, which actually isn't the subject and the question that the committee is being asked. So that's, the, you know, that's the, my judgment on the last few weeks in that respect. But in coming to the committee with the bill, I have taken all the necessary advice that I need to take to satisfy me in my judgment that the two issues of proportionality and a codification have been addressed in the bill. But as I say, that's if there's a legal challenge, the courts will determine that. Now, Mr Mundell raised an issue about um, derailing the agenda. And of course, the agenda can be derailed in a whole host of different ways. It can be derailed by the fact that um, practitioners become anxious about deploying some of these measures because they don't feel they've got a clear legal framework in place. And I'm trying to put a clear legal framework in place. 
the agenda can be derailed by a court challenge, obviously, that says, well, this legislation is not fit for purpose, and, 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 and that's, that's a judgment that the courts would arrive at if they faced a legal challenge. But what I want to assure the committee about is that what I'm bringing to the committee is not something that's unnecessary. It's not something that we don't need to do. It's something we do need to do if we want to have in place the type of support that makes the child's plan and the getting it right for every child agenda meaningful through the exercise of the named person responsibilities. So it's on that basis that I come to the conclusions that I come to. And then on the final point that, that Mr Mundell raises, uh, of course I take responsibility for all of my decisions as a minister, um, and they're my decisions, and I have to be accountable for all those decisions. Okay, um, I wondered if I could then ask Kavira just a number of technical uh, questions. How big um, a number? What? How big a number? Hi, three. Uh, and I'll stick to them. Uh, they're quite they're, they're quite snappy. Um, I wondered uh, there are th um, in terms of uh, the you said before that the legal framework had changed since 2014. Uh, I just wondered, uh, you know, given there are three uh, pretty prominent cases within the Supreme Court judgment: Sunday Times versus United Kingdom, uh, Gillen versus uh, the United Kingdom, uh, and uh, Silver versus the United Kingdom, all listed. Uh, in the in accordance with law section of that judgment, if you could talk me through how you felt the original legislation uh, met the considerations uh, of those cases set out in the Supreme Court judgment. Well, simply because the the thinking of the Supreme Court, the point I was making in my answer to Liz Smith, was that I think it is pretty clear that the thinking of the Supreme Court had developed subsequent to the passage of the 2014 Act and that the Scottish Government had formed its view on the basis of that point uh, and that approach prior to the Supreme Court's thinking becoming clearer in that respect. So that's the, the point that I make about the development of the Supreme Court thinking. Because, uh, uh, I think that the Supreme Court uh, also took issue uh, with uh, foreseeability uh, and I think that at paragraph uh, 77 uh, of the Supreme Court judgment, uh, it starts to it starts to talk about that, and I really wondered how uh, the Cabinet Secretary had interpreted uh, what was set out in Gillen uh, versus the United Kingdom at paragraphs 76 and 77, uh, because obviously that judgment was made in 2010, uh, before the last legislation was passed, um, and it, it talks about who uh, legislation is intended to cover, uh, and also. Uh, giving people protection against arbitrary uh, interference. Uh, and I just wondered whether the Scottish Government had considered those legal issues last time round uh, and whether it feels they're meeting them this time round. Well, I think the, what I think is the case is that the questions that are the, in the essence of the judgment that the Supreme Court made in 2016 on our provision were driven by... Um, a necessity and a requirement to ensure that the codification of different provisions were set out in a fashion that made the obligations clear on practitioners and on authorities in a fashion that was not viewed to be as obligatory in before 2014 and certainly not viewed as obligatory by the judgments that were made by the Court of Session, either in the Inner House or the Outer House at that time. So my point is that the Supreme Court's judgments were taking a form that required that to be essentially part of the legislative framework and consideration that we had to take into account. And the bill that is before the committee now is designed to do exactly that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Paul. Thank you, Vina. Um, Cabinet Secretary, I'd like to have a, a look at the uh, concept of well-being. The Supreme Court said that well-being is not defined, and the only reference they said that was available were the eight factors under Shinari, which has been around for a very long time, and even some of them were a little bit vague. Do you consider that well-being needs a more specific definition in order to ensure that the implementation of the legislation is consistent 
the the question of well-being was addressed in the 2014 Act, and in in that Act, the eight well-being indicators were the ones um, were, were set out: safe, healthy, active, nurtured, achieving, respected, responsible, and included. And these are, of course, subjective terms, but what they are designed to do is to provide a context within which professionals can exercise professional judgment about um, how effectively the well-being of a, a, a child or young person is being supported. And that's a framework that, with which professionals, it's not a new framework, it's a framework with which professionals have been operating for some time and um, assists in formulating the judgments that they make um, about whether the, the well-being of young people has been properly supported. So I think the definition is, um, is set out with a clarity with which professionals are familiar, which then enables them to exercise their judgments. There have been comments from some of the practitioners uh, that there does need to be flexibility in terms of the definition of well-being, simply to, because there is the, the, if the definition is too tight, they believe that there will be uh, discrepancies in the implementation and interpretation. At the moment, they were saying that the definition of well-being is sufficiently flexible that different practitioners can interpret it for their own discipline. And it works very well, trusting to their professional um, expertise. Would you agree with that, or is that too loose? Yeah, I, I think that's the, that's the framework in which professionals want to operate, because we are... The, the name person provision is about taking the proactive measures to intervene earlier to su provide support before problems become more serious issues, um, which may well affect the, the welfare and the safety of a child, which is a completely different regime, or where problems may crystallise into um, to, to be more serious and therefore require greater public sector interventions to meet the needs of a child. So you know, we're all familiar with the rationale that the earlier we can intervene to support a child or a young person or a family, the better that is going to be. And the well-being definition that's in section 96 of the 2014 Act is designed to create the framework within which professionals can operate to exercise that judgment. Comments have also been made about uh, training in different local authorities where perhaps some of the, the training would move you down a different, slightly different definition of well-being. And uh, that seems to be welcomed by a number of the practitioners. But does it create a difficulty if there is a, a, a national rollout of some, of some sort of training programme? Would that preclude that? No, because this, this, this legislation is predicated on professional judgment. And it's for professionals who we trust ordinarily to exercise these responsibilities on a regular basis to interpret and consider these, um, these characteristics and decide uh, whether there is a requirement to, to, to offer support, to intervene in any particular way uh, to meet the needs of young people. So there's a, there's a range of, um, of indicators that are set out in Section 96 but it's up to professionals to decide how best to exercise the judgment within that framework. There's been some comment to the committee that there should be a definition, that it should be on the face of the bill or in the code of practice. From what you're saying, uh, that would not be the case. We, we have the well-being indicators which are very clear. I think what's important is in our education and training around the exercise of these responsibilities that we listen carefully to the practice of professionals and we ensure that that practice informs the guidance that's available to anybody who's required to exercise responsibilities in this way. Did you want to come you know, uh, Just to pick up what I think is a fundamental uh, dilemma that we face, you're quite right to say that there are practitioners who believe that the uh, well-being uh, principle 
is flexible and allows for professional judgment. The problem is that if they are challenged on, uh, and probably more so challenged because they now have a duty to consider whether to share information or not, if that challenge takes place, they are much less secure in the knowledge that their judgment will be accurate because of the subjective nature of the Shinari indices. And that's my understanding, one of the concerns that the Supreme Court had, that well-being has this subjective nature to it, which might suit flexibility and professional judgment. What it doesn't suit, and what's come through loud and clear, is the concern amongst professionals if they get legally challenged on something, the Shinari indices will not be an adequate definition for well-being. I, 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 I don't accept that point because I, because I don't think anything in, that res in, in respect of the framework is, is changing as a consequence of this legislation. The, the Shinari indicators are there. They are part of the, the framework of consideration that professionals are exercising their responsibilities within just now. Um, there is obviously a, a question of um, the judgments that get arrived at by professionals in this respect. But fundamentally, the, the areas of activity that we're talking about here are areas of activity where individuals can quite clearly form a judgment about what is the best thing to do to provide the support to an individual child, young person or family. And that's the professional judgment we rely upon as a society on an ongoing basis for these professionals to make that judgment. So could, I, could I just seek clarification on that? Do you accept that the change from uh, the duty to share and now becoming the duty to consider whether to share adds a complexity that is part of the concern for the practitioners? No, because what, what this, the reason why we're legislating here is that, and why we legislated in 2014, is that good practice, which we've seen being deployed in different parts of the country, is what it is. Good practice deployed in different parts of the country, but not in all parts of the country. And what this legislation is, is a prompt to give impetus to ensure that we are taking a more proactive approach, a more preventative approach um, consistently across the country so that that good practice is available more widely than just in some parts of the country. That's why we legislated in the first place. And essentially what we're completing in this process is the framework that enables us to ensure that that uh, good practice is available to some people in some parts of the country is available right across the country. Okay, thank you. Before I let Daniel Johnson and Joanne's got a brief point on this question of having a, a duty to consider and what that looks like. A duty to share has a benefit. It's simple. You have an obligation, and if you don't share, you can go back and test it, and you're, you're responsible for the fact you didn't. What would a duty to consider look like in terms of what? how would you have to evidence that you had considered and then decided not to share, or evidence you'd considered and then decided to share? That feels like a different thing from simply an exercise of professional judgment. You would expect, or would you expect, that there need to be evidence, that you, written evidence? Would you have to take a log? What would that look like? I, th I think the, what we envisage, and obviously that's something that we, we have to discuss very carefully with um, our stakeholders, so, um, so has that not been discussed? It, well, it's, it's part of the discussion that will have to go on to ensure that we have the... the Sorry, the it's con not been discussed when you decided that you'd move from a duty to share to a duty to consider to share, what that actually would look like, what the implications would be for MD who was going to exercise that duty? Well, yes, we, we have discussed that. What the, the nature of that change of the responsibility from duty to share to duty to consider, of course that's been discussed, yes. What we need to be, what we need to have further discussion about, is exactly what, um, what, what might well be the requirements of demonstrating what the duty to consider, how the duty to consider was exercised, and I think it's important that we listen carefully to stakeholders and practitioners as we go through that exercise to make sure 
that it's not burdensome, that it is consistent with the exercise of professional duties, and that it is demonstrated in a fashion that addresses the, the issues that the bill requires. Can I just say, with respect, I would have expected that work to be done before you put it into a bill, whether it's doable or achievable or not, that you might already have thought what would that look like, rather than you give the duty and then later on well, you're but, going to have that conversation. It seems good, to be the wrong way round. But the, the good practice already exists that demonstrates how professionals consider these points, and it's a case of engaging with that good practice um, and with the professions and to make sure that we, uh, well, we, 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 we take it forward in a fashion that's consistent with, um, with that good practice. Okay, Daniel. Thank you, convener. The scope of what information can be shared isn't altered by this bill, either in terms of the nature of that information or the quality of information. That set out in the Data Protection Act and uh, is on the basis of, of, of child protection. I was wondering if the Cabinet Secretary uh, agrees with that assertion, and, and if so, is it conceivable that there is ever a, a situation where information could be shared on the basis of well-being if it doesn't meet that child protection threshold set out in the Data Protection Act? The, I think Mr Johnson is inviting me to make a distinction which I don't think can exist because in all circumstances there is an obligation to operate within the existing legal framework on data protection. So there is... Um, I, I, Unless I'm misunderstanding the question, um, th there is an obligation on practitioners to operate within the framework of the existing law in whatever circumstance they are operating. I mean, the reason I asked that question is that, that I think clarity is at the absolute heart of this. And in terms of what the duty to consider looks like, that, that clarity is very important. You know, it, for no other reason uh, than it was one of the things that the Supreme Court set out. And my concern is that we are asking uh, pr practitioners to consider on the basis of well-being, but, but what is actually permitted is dictated by um, child protection uses set in the, the, the DPA. And then that, essentially, we're asking them to consider on the basis of one set of criteria, but what they're permitted to share is dictated by another set of criteria. Now, that indeed led Jenny Scott from the First Committee of Advocates to describe it as a, a difficult juggling act. And, and Kenny Meehan um, uh, described it, and in particular around consent, as balancing two irreconcilable points. I, I was just wondering you know, what the, the, the Cabinet Secretary's response to that, that point is. I mean, I, well, my, my response is that the practitioner must operate within the law, and the law will st stipulate that their actions have to be consistent with the contents of the Data Protection Act. Now, that's in relation to um, any question of well-being. On the question of a child protection issue, and I only, I only add this in for completeness, mm -hmm. there are, of course, exceptions on child protection matters that allow provisions of the, well, with the Data Protection Act provides exceptions where a child protection issue is at stake for information to be shared because there may be concern that a crime has been committed. Mm -hmm. That would not be available, not be available on the question of well-being because the Data Protection Act does not provide for that to be the case in relation to well-being. But you do accept that this Act is explicitly asking practitioners to consider on the basis of one set of criteria, but the scope of what may be may be shared is set out by Data Protection Act or its successive uh, legislation. Yes. That's the situation. So finally, you described in your, your earlier points that, that the information sharing is necessary uh, for the, 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 the role of the named person and the operation of that policy. And indeed, Ross Greer asked you about alternative approaches. Now, in the view of Jenny Scott, indeed, clan child law, that this could proceed without information sharing on the basis that information can already be shared under existing law. And, and I was just you know, wondering why the, the Cabinet Secretary felt that the named person couldn't be put into operation or under that basis, essentially with information sharing 
being on the basis of, of, of policy rather than legislation, therefore removing this complexity altogether. Essentially, for the reason that I think I answered Liz Smith a moment ago, that we have good practice in some parts of the country, but we don't have it everywhere. And this is essentially legislation to get us to a position of taking forward good practice to support children and young people and their families in all parts of the country. So that was that, and that's a, that's a decision that essentially was prompted by the Act in 2014. Now, we're in a, a hiatus situation just now, because if we roll the, the, the clock back to before 2014, legislation was taken forward to roll out this good practice. That was the purpose of the, the legislation. We now find ourselves in a situation where we have some legislative uncertainty. And my worry would be that if we do not complete this journey, then that good practice will not be rolled out. And we may in fact have a rolling back of good practice because there will be uncertainty over the legal framework. But my understanding is the information sharing is but one component of the, of the name person role. The other points in terms of liaising with families, coordinating with, with services, being that single point of contact, none of those things are uh, fundamentally undermined by uh, information sharing provisions being brought forward or not. And indeed, the information sharing could still take place. So I, again, I ask, I, I don't understand why the role of the name person is, is fundamentally, I, I accept that there, there may be elements that would be more difficult without it potentially, but I don't see that it's fundamentally flawed if you don't have the information sharing provisions brought forward. Essentially, the, the duty to consider information sharing then requires all professionals to consider whether or not there is something they need to do or to, to act upon as part of this provision. So it's moving from a situation and much of this is tied up with the uh, original thinking around the legislation in the run-up to the 2014 Act, that we were trying to create um, an approach that would ensure more young people were able to have access to this type of support, where it wasn't always the case in all parts of the country. So it was about providing the legislative impetus to ensure that good practice was able to be deployed. Now, where we find ourselves now is in a situation where I think there is a considerable amount of nervousness amongst the professional community about the issue. And I think the committee in Parliament has got two choices about how to address that. Either to agree this bill and create legislative certainty in that fashion, or not agree the bill and um, try to ensure that the practice that Mr Johnson has talked about, which is formulated on largely a voluntary basis, will actually prevail within Scotland. And I would be concerned that because of the legal debate we've had, because of the hiatus that we are in, unless we provide legal certainty through the passage of this bill, then that good practice will be undermined. Okay. Thank you. Gillian, did you, you want to come? based on what you've just said, Cabinet Secretary, and the nervousness of practitioners, there's also considerable nervousness amongst families now that we've had this, this period of time where the named person legislation and information sharing has been discussed in the media and, and at, at society at large. You mentioned about a public information campaign. How is that going to take into account disseminating confidence to families and indeed to children who might have, who will have to use the name person service. What we would want to do is to make sure that we adequately and effectively counter um, the unease that there is clearly and the uncertainty that's been created as a consequence of the, um, the Supreme Court's decisions and the pause that we've had to put in place on the implementation of the legislation so that we can um, take care proactively and 
dispassionately to set out what are the merits of the legislation, the services that are available and the supportive role that would be envisaged. And I think it's important that we try to um, ensure that members of the public are, are, are equipped, um, whether that's a child or a parent, uh, with that information. And will, um, in terms of the code of practice, the the way the Code of Practice is written be written in such a way that it's understandable to families who might actually want to look at it to, to know how their information might be shared? Uh, that has to be uh, a requirement. The Code of Practice is of no value if people can't understand it, whoever they happen to be. And if whoever's got a relationship to the Code of Practice, they must be able to understand it. Thank you. OK, thank you, Tavish. Tavish. Thank you. Can I wonder if I could yeah, um, ask a couple of questions about the Code of Practice, but I should start by defending Oliver Mundell. When Mr Swinney was in opposition, he used to demand lots of us resigned on a regular basis, and I'll, I'll pass a few of his uh, press releases over from those days, John, because I, I, I have don't, them. I, uh, I, I, have a, I have a very different recollection of events, <laughs> Mr Scott. Well, indeed not. Um, I wonder if uh, I could start by um, asking the Cabinet Secretary if he would accept that much of the evidence laid to this committee in respect of the Code of Practice, and indeed I'm sure to uh, his office personally um, uh, reflects that practitioners believe the Code of Practice is central to the provisions of this proposed legislation. Yes. And therefore, um, does he think that the Code can be finalised prior to the finalisation of the UK Data Protection Act? Um, yes. Uh, with certainty? Yes. And when will that be? Well, I don't know when... Uh, uh, but it'll be Scott, 2018? If Mr Scott will forgive me, I'm... A, a, Predicting the course of the UK government is not something that I think any of us can do with great confidence at this particular moment. But oh, my, my point is, I'm, 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 I'm being flippant where I shouldn't be. The, the, what I would accept is that there may well be changes that will come in the future yeah. to the legislative framework because we don't have, we do not in this parliament have competence over all of the issues that may well be, be in, uh, affected by the data protection framework, but we don't have, we don't have legislative competence over data protection. Mm. So there may well be changes in legislation that come, and we would have to make sure that we were acting and we had guidance and we had a code of practice in place that was compatible with whatever the emerging legal framework was. Yeah, I mean, entirely take the point that we don't know when that'll, when that'll be the case, but it's not going to be in the next six months, is it, to, to the best of your knowledge? No, I wouldn't. No, have. and therefore, the, in the letter you wrote to the committee on the 6th of November, in which um, you uh, suggest that you're establishing, or don't more than suggest, you say you're establishing a, a practice development panel late, uh, this month, November, is that panel to uh, undertake word, work on the Code of Practice, or is that different from the consultation you envisage on the Code of Practice? Yeah, that's to, to, to undertake work on the Code of Practice. And, how, and uh, am I right in saying that this letter reads that you have yet to appoint a chair and the people on that panel. That's correct. So yes. when will those people be in place? I'll do it very, very swiftly. Okay, and when do you envisage it concluding its work? The, obviously the, 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 the group will conclude its work um, in a timely fashion once the bill has completed its passage within the Scottish Parliament and once due consultation and dialogue has taken place to get us to a point where the, the framework is, um, is judged to be effective and appropriate and then can come forward for parliamentary scrutiny. There's no reason why, would it be fair to say, the panel couldn't begin its work irrespective of whatever stage Parliament's reached on this matter? Oh, well, well, I envisage that starting in yeah. the next, in the course, certainly before the bill has, assuming the bill um, moves into the further stages of its parliamentary passage, then... Um, uh, I, th that work can start uh, within this process. And uh, the work it's going to do, I was interested in the language you used in the, in the um, letter where, where it reads, the code, to, uh, the code uh, to be made under the Act once passed will quite properly start from a, quote, blank piece of paper. Now, do you want to just uh, explain well, to me why to you used a blank piece of paper as a language there? Okay, okay, what I was trying to say there was that... Um, I'm not going to oblige the group that comes together to take the illustrative code of practice as their starting point. That's the point I was trying to make. So the committee therefore really has no sight at this stage of, of what that code may look like? 
at all? Well, I've given, well, yes, it does, because I've given a draft illustrative code of practice, which I have accepted as perhaps not been the finest piece of work the government has ever produced. Um, so that's there to try to help the committee in its deliberations. But what I think is important, this is, this is exactly the dilemma that I judged would be part of these proceedings. The legislation that is before Parliament and the question the committee has to answer is whether it supports the general principles of the bill, which envisages the creation of a code of practice. Now, my judgment was the committee would perhaps ask me for, an illustrative, for a code of practice to be available whilst considering the bill, which is why I introduced the, code of, the draft illustrative code of practice that I did. But equally, I could have taken the view, well, look, that's for a, another day. That's for later on in the process. And then the committee could have asked me the question that Mr. Scott has just asked me. So what I'm trying to signal here is that the advice I have taken says to me that the only way we can proceed to address the issues of the Supreme Court are to put in place the, the bill, to follow it with a, a, a code of practice, and the code of practice needs to be formulated in a fashion that commands confidence amongst practitioners, professionals, and members of the public, and children and families. Um, and we've got to make sure that we do that properly. Yeah, I, I take the last point of that. I don't frame the question in, in that way, but I take the, the last point that the code of practice must command a confidence, and therefore, given we're dealing with in some sense, a very narrow piece of legislation. Um, the Court of Practice is core to this, that, and you accepted that in your original answer. Therefore, I find it very difficult to see how the committee, uh, the dilemma the committee is in here, across, I think across all of our, all of our considerations, is, is how we give consent to a narrow, a narrow principle in relation to a, uh, to a Supreme Court ruling, yet we don't know, and we do not know at this stage, what that code's going to be. Because Gillian Martin asked a very fair question. It's got to appeal to families. The one we saw might have appealed to lawyers, but certainly didn't appeal to families. Well, fundamentally, I think the question that Mr Scott puts to me is answered by the commitment I gave at the outset of the committee hearing, that Parliament will have the final say on the contents of the code. That's another way of looking at that, but that's uh, for another... Well, no, well, sorry, I think that's a very significant way, because Mr Scott... The committee has not been asked today to sign up to the Code of Practice, no, nor indeed. has Parliament. No, the indeed. committee has been asked to sign up to the draft, the, to the principle, the general principles of the bill. And I've conceded today um, that in a change to the proposition, because I've listened to the evidence of the committee, I have conceded that Parliament will have the final say by vote on the contents of the Code of Conduct. So the provisions of the bill already envisage that I would lay um, I would um, lay the code of practice um, in draft within Parliament. The code of practice would be available for consultation in Parliament for 40 days. Um, I must take account of any comments on the draft code expressed by Parliament within that 40 day period and I'm now proposing to amend the bill to put in another stage in that process that the code will come back to Parliament for Parliament to decide itself, not me, Parliament, whether the code is acceptable. But there's, there's so there's a, a huge, there's a huge change yeah. in the position. Sure, but there's, a, there's an absolutely opposite view to all that, which is the code of practice core to this, which we've agreed, I think we've accepted that, and the code, therefore, has to be the fundamental starting point for how this committee should consider it. And despite all you have just said on the parliamentary process, and I totally accept that you've moved and suggested some new ways of, of Parliament seeing these things, and that's a well, that could be seen by those who see the parliamentary process as, as the right thing, the fundamental issue for us as a committee is we, ha we haven't got a code, and yet you're asking us to approve something without a code. But I'm not, been asked, but I'm not asking you to approve the code. I'm asking we you are to. At a later I'm, stage. I'm, well, at a later stage, you'll yeah. have the opportunity. The Parliament will have the opportunity to accept or reject yeah. the code. Okay. So, and the code is not new law. And this is a point I went through in detail with the, the delegated powers um, committee. Yeah. It right, is so. not new law. It is explanatory information. But Parliament will be the judge of whether we have done that satisfactorily or not. So the committee 
under no circumstances has been asked to approve a code at this stage. It has been asked to um, approve the general principles of, principles of the bill, which require us to bring a code, which is subjected already to significant parliamentary scrutiny, and I've just accepted another layer of that scrutiny where Parliament will have a veto over that code. Yeah, but the principles are nothing without the code, are they? But the code can't happen unless Parliament votes for it. Yeah, okay, but we could... We are, you're I, going, we are going uh, one other final question. Now. I take it we're going yeah, around yeah. in circles, and that's as much my fault as anyone else's. Um, I, the one other question I had, convener, if that was all right, is that I just wanted to, to uh, quote the RCN, who I presume sent this email to, to, all, of, to all of us uh, overnight, but the bit that I thought was important in this is that they consider... Um, they support the principles, but they, but they do not support the legislation as is currently introduced uh, because they do not consider it to be the answer to the question. But they, they specifically say, uh, in relation to duty to consider, we believe this may undermine the principles of GERFEC by resulting in defensive practice. And that's, you know, by, by practitioners, pretty hot on practitioners in this committee because the evidence has been powerful here. Um, do, do you, do, does the Cabinet Secretary accept that concern? And if so, what's the answer to it? Well, the answer to it is that um, there will be a, a variety of different opinions because the <laughs> committee has had a, 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 a letter from a whole variety of organisations involved in this area of policy, Aberlour, Children's Scotland, Crossreach, Includem, Children's Health Scotland, Social Work Scotland, um, One Parent Family Scotland, Enable Scotland. I'm sure I agree with all that, Mr. Scott, but I'm talking about the RCN. Yeah, and then in the... In, in the field of, um, of the health service, um, the Nursing and Midwifery Council, we can currently see no conflict between the draft legislation proposed and our own regulatory approaches, notably our code. Um, the um, Royal Society of General Practitioners, we welcome the amended wording of the bill as it meets our concerns regarding the threat to doctor-patient confidentiality contained in the original bill. Uh, we welcome the uh, GMC Scotland, we welcome the proposed move away from creating a mandatory duty to share information about children and young people with a named person. So these issues are, I think, <laughs> they're the subject of discussion and debate amongst organisations. But if Mr Scott's looking for evidence, there's plenty of evidence of organisations. So they are saying wrong, Well, they are saying they've got their opinions and, and, and they're entitled to express them. And, and, and as Mr Scott knows, I, uh, I simply marshal evidence of different opinions in front of the committee for the committee to judge. Thank you. Thank you, Tavish. Um, that Daniel wanted to come in briefly. So just on a point of clarification around the status of the, the Code of Practice, um, I hear what the Cabinet Secretary is saying. Are those provisions in terms of parliamentary scrutiny going to be on the face of the bill? And also, can I just ask, will that apply to changes in the future to the Code of Practice, i.e. will it have the status of secondary legislation? Um, the provisions that I went th if in, um, in section one, um, subsection four of the bill, um, on page three of the bill, at the amended, the new section 26B of the 2014 Act, um, Subsection 6, Scottish Ministers must lay before the Scottish Parliament a draft code of practice they propose to issue. Subsection 7, the Scottish Ministers must issue the code of practice, it must not issue the code of practice until after the expiry of the period of 40 days beginning with the day in which the draft code was laid before the Parliament. 8, the Scottish Ministers must, in the code of practice they issue, take account of any comments on the draft code expressed by the Parliament within that period. So that's on the face of the bill yeah. already. I will bring forward a Stage two amendment, which the committee, if it approves stage one, will consider, which will apply an additional provision, which is that the that we'll have to we'll have to tidy this all up, but it will essentially say the code of practice cannot be um, put in place until Parliament has agreed that to be the case. Um, and then obviously if we were to bring forward any subsequent code of practice to take account of changes in data protection legislation, mm -hmm. for example, mm -hmm. we would have to go through the same process okay. to do that. Now, it would not have the status of secondary legislation because it's not legislation. Mm -hmm. It's explanatory information. But what I'm trying to do is to address what I can clearly detect as a parliamentary concern about how the guidance can have 
sufficient authority and command sufficient confidence in Parliament by enabling that proposal to be considered by Parliament and for Parliament to have Parliament rather than me to have the final say. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Oliver. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. Um, I understand the Scottish Government has been engaging with a number uh, of uh, outside organisations about the draft code of practice uh, and some of the changes set out in the Cabinet Secretary's letter. I just wondered from a point of view of parliamentary scrutiny, obviously this committee has spent a long time uh, taking evidence uh, from various organisations, uh, you know, some of whom you know, have given evidence based on one thing uh, that, 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 that now is no longer as, as central to uh, our consideration of the bill. And I just wondered you know, how the Cabinet Secretary uh, sort of expects the committee to sort of really scrutinise uh, you know, what I would see maybe as a sort of shadow consultation with a set group of organisations. Well, the committee will make its judgments based on what the committee hears. And will uh, the Scottish Government share uh, any of the information around the discussions and concerns in more detail that they've had uh, with some of the organisations, including some uh, who have now uh, written a letter revising uh, their position from, from what they submitted at the start of our evidence taking? I would say that a fair summary of all of these issues is what I set out in my letter to the convener, which I issued on Monday. Um, and how many organisations uh, did the Scottish Government meet with uh, ahead of us taking evidence, but after they'd submitted written evidence to the committee? Well, we meet with organisations on, a, on on an ongoing basis, constant basis. I, I see, you know, I see these organisations. I talk about these issues uh, on a, a constant basis, and I've, you know, volunteered to the committee that I've obviously listened. Okay. I've heard the evidence. I've been watching every week of the committee's proceedings. Um, I'm alert to the concerns that have been expressed. They've been addressed openly. I've come here. I've accepted that there have been elements of, our, uh, of the steps that we've taken that we've not got right. Mr Mandel asked me earlier on about my accountability. I've come here and said I made a judgment. I said to my officials here, listen, we're going to have to put in a code of practice, a draft illustrative code of practice um, in the bill. It wasn't part of our original plan because that's not what the committee was been asked to judge. The committee was been asked to judge should we have a duty to consider, should we have a, have a code of practice. I decided to add that in during the proceedings. We couldn't undertake the consultation and I've accepted that we didn't get that right. So I'm not hiding anything from the committee. The committee's heard the evidence. I've listened carefully to it and I've addressed it in an open published letter to the convener of the committee on Monday. So and I'm here to answer questions about it. So would you accept that there are some people who gave evidence to this committee who potentially have changed their evidence before giving oral evidence on the basis of reassurances they've received in private from the Scottish Government that this committee wasn't aware of at the time we took evidence? Well, the, the, world, the world moves on. Uh, you know, I, I, I wrote a letter to the committee on Monday which sums up the changes that I'm making to the approach in light of the feedback that I've had from individuals. There's nothing private about it. I've sent a published letter to the committee and I'm sitting here in a televised session able to be viewed by anyone around the world explaining what I've done. So there's nothing private about it. There's no secret information. I've just simply listened to what the evidence the committee's taken, realised we've got some difficult issues to address, and I'm openly addressing them in front of the committee. You, you, the share, you, or, share, uh, you shared uh, the Scottish Government, potentially shared the Scottish Government's intentions for the future of this bill uh, with some organisations who were giving evidence to this committee before they appeared here. Do you think that that has a potential to affect the evidence um, that they, they gave? I don't actually think that is the case, Mr Mundell, because I think, well, I'd have to go and look at all of the details of the, um, the dates, but... I've been listening to organisations coming here. See, there's a logical inconsistency in Mr Mundell's point to me, because I would only be... I've listened to the evidence of the committee, so I've seen organisations come here and say, we've got this concern and that concern. So they've said that already. I've then gone away and had various discussions with people to understand better their perspective, and I've formulated a letter to the committee, which I've sent and is published. I'm here to give evidence and to be answered about it. So... 
you know, we, we're we're working in dialogue with organisations all the time, but I don't, I've not, I've not shared my private thinking with anyone before they gave evidence. I don't think, because I'm here to give evidence myself today, and I gave you know, my set my position out to the committee on Monday. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, convener. Thank you, Ross. Thanks, convener. Uh, forgive me if this is a, a naive question, but it came from a, a recent visit to a group of practitioners said that I would raise it. Their concern was that because the code's primary purpose is to ensure that legal compliance, that it may not be possible to ever shape it into a fashion that they would find it accessible and usable. And the um, <clears throat> proposal that they mooted was that instead of the code being uh, directed at the, the practitioners themselves, the code was essentially uh, directed towards the legal representative of the practitioners, local authority, legal services department, etc. Um, and that the practice guidance was what was directed immediately to the, the practitioner. Is that possible? Um, if I understand Mr. Greer correctly, uh, am I being asked, is it possible, is it desirable for the code of practice to be addressed to the legal representatives and the guidance to be addressed to practitioners? Is that the question? Yes, so as it stands, it's the code of practice for practitioners. Their concern was that it may not ever be in a fashion that they found usable and that perhaps if well, the code it, was not directed well, at them... No, but it, it, it has to be usable mm. by practitioners. So that's, that's the challenge that we've got to make sure that we get right as part of our dialogue with them. I'd like to come in on that point. I mean, I, I wonder, as part of that behind that, that the, the legal responsibility, I think it touches on something that Liz Smith was talking about earlier on, about the individual fearing them being held responsible. Is this about the practitioners want to make sure uh, well, that the body is held responsible uh, and not the individual? Okay. And can well, let, 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 let me provide a little bit of clarity then, uh, convene on that point. Um, the, the, the code of practice has to be available and usable by anybody who's exercising these responsibilities. So we have to get that into um, a shape and a character that enables that to be the case. In relation to the legal responsibility for any decisions that are taken or approaches taken, that falls on the organisation, not the individual. So that, the, the legal position is crystal clear on that. Uh, Daniel, very briefly, and then Tavis. I mean, Jenny Scott, to this very point, said that the, the Code of Practice is balancing such complicated legal uh, points that it, 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 she didn't, couldn't conceive that, that it could be a straightforward point. I mean, do you accept that, or, or, I mean, or, or how, do you, how do you seek to attempt to resolve these complex legal decisions in a Code of Practice? Because we, we have to articulate it in a way that will be usable by uh, practitioners within the services that are operating in this fashion. So we, we have to get that, um, uh, the, the, the necessary input to make sure that the document will have that usability by practitioners. So, so I mean, is she wrong to, to question the possibility well, it's of it's, that? Look, it's her opinion. Tavish? Yeah, thank you, um, Kavina. Uh, um, so on the legal responsibility in relation to schools, um, it will not be a head teacher who will be legally responsible in that sense. It will be a, a local authority. Correct. And the governance reforms that you published yesterday will, will make no difference to that. Correct. Thank you. Claire. Thank you, Vina, and um, thank you to the Cabinet Secretary for coming along today. Um, you will be aware from the evidence that we've heard uh, from practitioners, uh, certainly, uh, and from uh, other uh, professional bodies that there's significant concern about training and time to for staff and practitioners to be able to receive correct training to implement the name person. Um, and certainly that was something that we heard when we had our focus groups uh, last week. So I'm really pleased to, to see that you're, you're saying that there will be some additional funding. Um, I think further financial support was, was the expression that you used, Cabinet Secretary. I wonder, could you expand on, on what is actually going to be available to organisations to, to roll out the training for, particularly Part 4 and Part 5? Mm. We already made provision in the original 2014 legislation for uh, funding to be available, which was distributed to relevant uh, local authorities, public bodies, to support the uh, 
uh, the, the training and necessary equipping of professionals to take forward the, um, the responsibilities. Uh, obviously, I want to make sure that we adequately address the issues of resourcing that are raised by different bodies. So what my plan would be as, as we take the bill forward is to work with stakeholders to identify exactly how the provision of such support can be put in place to, to address those issues. And obviously at later stages in the bill, um, I will make the specific provisions on that available to the committee. And will the, the panel that you're convening, will they have some input into what that training will be, um, assuming that some of that training will be different from what was originally rolled out? Uh, yes, they will have, yeah. I, envisage, uh, I want to ensure that they can shape that, um, uh, that agenda. So some of the organisations who, who raise that concern, I, I would assume, yeah. maybe may well be part of them. They will be, yeah. 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 And the, the, another issue that, that was raised with us was about other people who are not named persons or other organisations who are not named persons, but who will feed information into named persons. Is there some provision for training for them? Yes, and also there will be the wider awareness raising approaches that we take forward to, to make sure that um, there is a, a wider understanding of the role of the named person and how individuals can contribute to the valuable work that named persons will represent. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Liz, you wanted to come in briefly. Mr Swinney, just on the question of training, you've acknowledged uh, in your letter and you acknowledged again this morning that there will be an increased cost. Could you give us some idea of what that increased cost will be? I, I can't at this stage. Um, because I want to have that dialogue with stakeholders to make sure that I can address the issues properly. And um, that is dialogue that I will take forward uh, during the course of the bill to ensure that uh, I can adequately assess what is required and be in a position to give clarity to Parliament as to what that will, uh, what that will envisage. Okay, so Julie? Thank you. I have some questions around the, the, the training that happened before when, for example, local authorities thought this was going ahead and then there was a Supreme Court judgment. Was there, was there um, funding given for training at that point and what happened to that funding as a result of the, the sort of hiatus that we've had? Well, we distributed, um, if my memory says me right, about 10, just over £10 million to local authorities. And uh, as with all funding of that type, it was distributed to local authorities and um, uh, that's where it remains. Right. And so some local authorities will have put in place training already and some didn't. Um, I imagine it's a variable picture across local authorities. Yeah. Um, for those that maybe did training maybe back in, you know, a, a few years ago now, what, will there be a need, could there be a need, or are you, f are you getting feedback from them that there be a, a, a need for more training to happen? Maybe they've spent some of their training budget because they've thought this was coming in, and now they'll have to redo that training. All local authorities um, confirmed to us um, after the passage of the 2014 Act that they were ready for implementation, because uh, we had a commencement date of August 2016 um, in this respect. Um, so obviously the training activities of local authorities have been taken forward within that context. Uh, clearly, the evidence has indicated that there is uh, a desire and a need for further uh, training and support, and that's what I want to discuss with stakeholders to make sure we can adequately address that. And I just have one further question. It's, it's, I suppose it comes back to the, the duty to consider and any kind of documentation that might be required as a result of that. Um, are you uh, taking into account that there might be, as a result of the the decisions made on that, an increase in workload for certain practitioners, and, and uh, how has that been uh, addressed? There, you know, when I look at the exercise of responsibilities by public servants at local level, um, there are many public servants who are operating in this space where they are assessing and considering the, uh, the needs of individuals and how they can most effectively support them. And so a lot of that existing practice is going on amongst teachers who are looking at the well-being of children in their care or um, health visitors 
and we've obviously six, uh, substantially expanded the uh, the number of health visitors within Scotland, and there's further expansion underway. So the, 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 there's a lot of that activity is uh, already undertaken. What the bill envisages is that duty to consider sharing information being applied on a more widespread basis, and obviously uh, that will change the, the nature and the character of some of the work that is taken forward. Um, but I think what, you're, what also has to be borne in mind is that where this practice has been rolled out, it has re resulted in a reduction in caseload because of the proactive work that's been undertaken to achieve the objectives of named person, which are to avoid more complex cases arising because earlier intervention has avoided uh, that need from crystallising. Thank you very much. OK, thank you. And uh, lastly, we have Joanne Lump. OK, thank you very much. Um, I suppose one of the things that strikes me in this conversation and all the evidence we've taken, how far away it feels from the real world and far away it feels from the young people we're wanting to support. And I think that I'm sure that's a concern that you share. Can I just ask first on this question of resources? Can you guarantee that the resources won't be removed from provision for young people and children to training? Yes. And could, I, could I perhaps also add that I, I do share the point that Joanne Lamont raises at the start of the question, because I think the difficulty with this particular bill, and it's the point that Mr Scott made earlier on in one of his questions, this is a very narrow point that we're having to, an important point, but it's a narrow point that we're having to address here in the bill because of the issues raised by the Supreme Court judgment. But it's, it is a point, however narrow, that is critical to enabling us to pursue the larger agenda, which is about supporting the well-being of children and young people in our communities. And I think it's, it's a challenge, because the committee has to scrutinise this very narrow part of the bill, to enable that larger picture to be taken into account. Well, I mean, I think, for me, the concern is, I think the judgment we'll have to make is whether this legislation makes the situation better or worse for young people. And what also strikes me from the evidence, which you've obviously um, paid a lot of attention to, is the extent to which there has not been a ringing endorsement of the legislation. There's not even been the position that you've taken, which is this is absolutely necessary in order to protect young people. In fact, many of the practitioners have said, well, actually, this is what we do anyway. This is not really necessary. And in fact, predicate their support for the bill on the quality of the code of practice. So there isn't um, a ringing endorsement. At best, you will get people who, who are committed on name person, on GIRFEC, saying, we can make this work. And we obviously, and you've mentioned this already, the letter from the group of charities, which is interesting and very useful to us, and we're grateful for it because they do outline that they do support the need for the duty to consider. But if I can read to you one paragraph, and I don't want to misrepresent what they've said because clearly their overall conclusion is that we should support the bill. However, we say we recognise that significant concerns remain. At this stage, we're prepared to work with the Scottish Government with the aim of producing a bill and code that can be supported by the majority of the children's sector and ultimately the Scottish Parliament. Our current support is contingent on the Scottish Government working effectively with the sector to produce revised measures that address the concerns in, um, expressed to date satisfactorily. So we are now in a position where we expect to support a bill which is, has only got conditional support from its strongest advocates, who, make, who, who in this letter contemplate the possibility that that won't succeed. And I wonder if you accept that that is a dilemma for this committee. And in fact, what it appears to me to be suggested, that these organisations want to go away and work with you from a base point of how do we make this work, rather than say, put the bill through and then see, can we make the best of it? I think the... the my response to that point has to be set within the wider position of every one of these organisations in relation to the question of the named person. Every one of these organisations wants the named person provision mm -hmm. to be put into practice and to put into effect and to be taken forward. 
And in some of their experience in some parts of the country, that provision will be working and it will be working voluntarily. In other parts of the country, it will not. Hence, the need for the legislative impetus to put that provision into place. So none of these organisations are casting any doubt about the importance of the named person provision, which is the legislation that's already on the statute book. But for it to commence, for it to be able to be have its potential realised, the bill before this committee needs to be passed. Because mm, I can't... That's not what they say. What no, they say no, no, is... No, please, please, what they well, say Kavira, can I, can I please complete my... my, my that, I'm not interpreting what the, 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 the signatories of this letter are saying. I'm purely and simply making a, a factual point to the committee that the name person provision cannot be commenced on the basis envisaged by the 2014 Act mm -hmm. unless the bill before this committee is passed. Mm -hmm. Now, what I've accepted, and I think my exchange with Mr Scott helped to clarify this point um, very significantly, that there is a job of work to be undertaken on the code of practice, which will ultimately depend upon a parliamentary decision as to whether it is enacted or not. So I'm putting much more um, involvement and participation for Parliament in this process than was envisaged in the Bill um, originally. And that's a crucial part of um, the, the, the approach that I'm taking. And also, the, 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 the final point I'd make in, in this respect about the letter from the organisations is that they um, support the concept of the, the, the process that the government is going through here, but obviously want to be immersed in ensuring that that takes the correct course. With and that's what I'm committed to. They say the more than that. They say that their support is contingent on a successful conclusion of that work. Now, that's a very different thing. They are contemplating the possibility that this legislation may not work. They're not saying, if it were simply, we know they support the name person, and many of us in the past and continue to seek to support it, but they're saying, it, it, not that notwithstanding, if they simply said the support of the name person legislative um, principle and this bill is required to deliver that, they would say that. They don't say that. They say the support for this is contingent upon an effective an outcome. And we've been asked to support a piece of legislation without knowing that that guarantee has already happened. And I think that, and I'm sure you'll accept that's a major problem. And then I wonder if you can maybe comment on the question of unintended consequences. And a an, an, an very significant amount of evidence, and I appreciate not everybody, some people said they would do their best and make it work. Some people felt that defensive practice would develop. Now, I understand other people have said it's already developed because of uncertainty. But would you share my concern that as a consequence of this legislation, people do begin to practice even more defensively than they have in the past, to the detriment of our shared commitment to um, the safety of our young people? The, the events that um, were associated with the Supreme Court challenge have created a very difficult set of circumstances for practitioners. Circumstances that we did not want to see happening. And this letter from the organisations makes it quite clear that the legal uncertainty is creating some of that risk-averse practice. So what we've got to make a judgment about is how do we resolve that issue? Because I'm at one with Joanne Lamont about wanting to see in place the um, clear process and practice that can support the well-being of children within our society. So if that's the destination we want to get to, we have to wrestle with what's the best way to do that in the light of where we find ourselves today in the aftermath of the Supreme Court judgment. And the question is whether that 
getting to the destination that John Lamont sets out will be either aided by the passage of the bill or hindered by the passage of the bill. In my view, it will be aided by the passage of the bill because we will be able to put in place the, the legal clarity that will enable good practice to be undertaken safely within the law and within the parameters of good guidance. If we don't pass the bill, then the concept of the name person, I think, goes into a hiatus. And as a consequence of that, I think the opportunities to support the enhancement of the well-being of young people in Scotland is diminished as a consequence. That is your view, but it's not the view that everybody shares. I wonder if you think, do you accept that there are significant numbers of people in the legal profession who don't accept that there's legal clarity in this matter now, and in fact there are, there are significant problems with it? Um, well, of, 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 of course, the committee's heard different legal opinions, and mm. I'm simply asking the, the committee to um, accept in, in, in good faith. And, and, and John Lamb is absolutely right. What I've just expressed to her is my opinion, and that's, I, I, you know, I just mm. give my opinion to, to Parliament. Mm. Parliament can, and the committee can consider my opinions. That's what this process is all about. But ultimately, the committee will also want to consider on what basis would I come to the committee with a bill? <clears throat> what will I have gone through to try to make sure the bill is sufficiently robust to meet the needs of this legislation? And that's, and I've gone through that necessary process to get to this point. And I think in that context, the, the bill helps us to provide that legal clarity, although I accept there will always be legal debate about some of these provisions. There is, of course, legal debate about provisions that Parliament has passed and which have been tested in the courts and on a number of occasions have been rejected by the courts and on some occasions they've been um, supported by the courts. Um, so it's not something that's a, a new concept in the territory we occupy. No, it's, it's not unique. I think I am interested, however, that, that basically, from my understanding, that the main thing that the government has done to address Supreme Court concerns is to move from a duty to share to a duty to consider. Can you confirm again that you've not had a conversation with stakeholders about actually whether that, what that duty to consider would mean for the individual um, practitioner and for the local authority or organisation that employs them? It's pretty fundamental whether it's workable or not. Well, we, we, we went through that process in the um, the latter part of 2016, where we discussed what was the way to respond yes, to this legislation. But what would that we, look like for and, the and, individual? And we, and we arrived at the duty to consider. We've discussed that with the National um, Implementation Group. We've discussed, we discussed it with our stakeholder forums. But in terms of the conclusions of what that looks like in reporting terms or in process terms, I want to make sure stakeholders have got an opportunity but to surely. shape that, so that because they, well, if, to, to ensure that we do give adequate space for stakeholders to inform the practice. But surely, if you there's a pretty fundamental way of dealing with this problem is to go from a duty to share to a duty to consider. Surely, in deciding on that move, you would test the practicality and the implications of such a duty. That is, would you have to write down your considered view, give evidence that you'd considered and rejected, considered and, and shared, and what would that then mean in terms of the implication for a practitioner in terms of defensive practice? It can't be that you would have decided to have a duty to consider without testing that, what that would mean in the real world, and what the implications for individual member of staff would, or practitioner would be. But on the last point, um, that position is crystal clear because the responsibility rests with um, the organisations involved. There will be issues of professional practice that will affect many professionals that will be the subject to ongoing discussion on a whole variety of different grounds, not specifically about the named person. And then also, uh, you know, we've, you know, we have discussed that the approach of the duty to consider as being the approach that uh, enables us to address the question of proportionality, 
that was raised by the Supreme Court in their judgment, and we have applied that to the legislation. What I'm simply saying to the committee is that I want to make sure that stakeholders can be fully involved in how we finalise the detail of how but, that is undertaken. But you haven't road tested the implication of our um, duty to consider on the individuals who'd have to do it. And would you accept that there would be an impact on individual, given the context? Well, but individuals. Given the context of the, the bridge between well-being and child protection, in the context, in the past, people have not supported there's been a problem when you would have expected them to support there was a problem. So it's about individual practice. There would be an implication for people. There would be an expectation on them professionally to behave in a particular way. So this duty is significant. It's not just about local but, authorities but and charity but, but, organisations. But, it will be about individual professionals. And therefore, the legislation will stand or fall by the capacity for that duty to consider to be deliverable, to be real, without creating defensive practice. But, profe but professionals, good decision making by professionals already relies upon proper and effective recording of information. That's an essential part of all judgments that are applied by professionals. And the simple point I'm making in relation to this issue is that I don't want to finalise the details of what that reporting arrangement looks like until such time as professionals have the opportunity to shape that as part of the ongoing process. But anyone that envisages that our professionals, and I know that Joanne Lamont, from her extensive experience in this area of activity, will know that the, record, the good recording of information to support good quality decision making is an essential component of that process. Mm -hmm. Can I add just a last point, because I think there is an issue about resources, and we accept that you've made more resources available. There can be a judgment about whether, in terms of children's organisations, if you had a choice, that's where you, you would focus them. But, I mean, this is, a, this is not a, a partisan point, and I make it quite seriously. One of the problems around the name person policy has been the way in which it's been represented and the lack of confidence in it and the lack of understanding of its purpose, even by its strongest advocates. And you say that you're going to have a, a national campaign. Given the extent to which people who don't support the policy don't have confidence in what the Scottish Government has done, have you looked at um, a campaign, a national campaign, that wouldn't be conducted by the Scottish Government in this regard, given that you're seen to, for whatever reason, and I don't, you know, I'm not casting aspersions at all on the Government, who I think in large part have, have sought to deliver the name person's policy um, from the best of intentions, but that lack of confidence surely won't be addressed by the Scottish Government having a national awareness campaign? And have you looked at other options and how that might be done? I, I, um, I'm certainly prepared to do so, um, because the point that Joanne Lamont makes um, it may well have some real substance about it. And it may be the best way to try to address some of these issues, to take it into a different sphere where we find a different way of going about this. Uh, so I will certainly give active consideration to that point. Okay. okay, thank you, uh, Joanne. Uh, just on, on the one of the points that was raised there, that there seemed to be uh, a, a number of witnesses that shared some of the concerns that, that Joanne Lamont did about the responsibility that could be laid on them, the difference between well-being and child protection. But it seemed to be more about the fact that they weren't sure that the, the local authority or the health board or who, the organisation that was legally responsible was going to be responsible. And when they, if they were given those guarantees, they said that some of their, their problems would disappear. And will there be strict guarantees given to individuals that it's only in terms of a legal case as it would be just now? Like so if they had done something that was criminally wrong, that they would be held responsible in a way that they, 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 they would be without the name person? In section 19, subsection 8 of the 2014 Act, it says responsibility for the exercise of the name person functions lies with the service provider rather than the named person. So there is protection in law an existing statute, which obviously would be commenced with these provisions uh, that's on the face of the 2014 Act. Okay, thank you. And just one last point, Cabinet Secretary. Do you, um, 
Would you consider that the practitioners will, in most cases, be able to continue to use informed consent uh, as a basis for sharing wellbeing information? I would imagine that would be the, uh, the almost universal approach that would be taken. Okay. Uh, in that case, can I thank you very much for your, for your evidence, and uh, we will take a short break while the panel leaves. Thank you very much. <laughs>